it's great to be introduced by a friend, right? I mean, <laughs> does it get better than this? Um, it's, it's a real joy to be here in Calgary because I, I, in some ways, um, you know, so much of the work I do began here, um, not least because, um, you know, my, my, my dad was a biologist at the University of Regina, but he was also the first provincial biologist in, in Alberta. And actually, that uh, pronghorn antelope, he, he's the world expert on the pronghorn antelope. And when I was a kid, you know, we, uh, we would go out on field trips with my dad looking at these guys and uh, capturing them. And that was a time when scientists uh, were trying to figure out how a single species worked. So my dad spent 30 years trying to figure out how that guy reproduced, how they fed, you know, what they did to, uh, you know, overwinter, all that kind of stuff. It was, it was really interesting that they could focus on a single species. And it was toward the end of my dad's career, really, as a biologist um, at the University of Regina, that, that they started f trying to figure out how an ecosystem worked. That was a big, new, brave discipline for scientists to try to figure out how a whole region worked or a whole ecosystem. And it was even later, long after my dad had retired, I think, that uh, scientists started to focus in really clearly on how planetary systems worked. Instead of just ecosystems or regions, it was really about, about planetary systems. And around that time, of course, they started to figure out that humans, our species, a single species, can affect planetary systems. And that's where I got really interested in working um, on science stuff. And I think it really all stems back to that science, that sense of scientific inquiry that, you know, we used to get around the dinner table when I was a kid. You know, you'd, a dinner table in our house would be like, uh, you know, my dad would come back on Thursday evenings after, the, uh, after giving his parasitology lecture and carve the beef and tell you all about the parasites and the, you know, th this was, and, uh, and try to explain to you how all that stuff worked. But, but there was also this sort of underlying spirit that you could figure things out if you tried, that you could, that you could go and conduct experiments and you could understand how things worked. And I think that that was what really, uh, you know, hit home for me as a, as a kid growing up in that household, that, that somehow there was, there was, a, there was a, a usefulness in trying to understand how things work and in trying to construct experiments to try to figure that out. And so as a journalist, once I, you know, once I got to Calgary, I was here from 1994 to about 2000, and um, you know, just sort of let loose on the province, in fact. You know, this was the, <laughs> this was the uh, I was the first person for the globe to write about not the oil patch or government, because those were the traditional ways that uh, the Globe and Mail covered Alberta, but I was sent here to try to explain Alberta to the rest of Canada, which was, yeah, I remember one time writing a story about the latte shops and, and sending it into my editors, and they said, no, that's not Calgary. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell us about latte shop, shops in Calgary. Tell us about cowboy boots and hats and stuff like that. But it, it, was, it was a real challenge to try to explain how Calgary worked to the rest of the world. And as I you know, spent my six or seven years here, what I discovered was that some of the best stories going were about science and the environment. It was, just a, it was an amazing world to explore here, and that's what really got me going into all of the work that I do now. In fact, it's, it's fascinating that, that it all began here. In fact, with some of the people who are sitting here at the Rogues Gallery in, in the front here um, who explained to me how all the science worked and sent me to scientists. So what I really do is go and talk to scientists. I mean, I, I do field research with them now. That's, that's mainly how I get my story. So I read their papers and then I go and, and track them down and ask them to explain things to me and I give myself the permission to ask the dumbest possible questions to, to them. And that's how the, this book, Seasick, really came about. And I want to tell you about what I discovered as I did the research for that book, because I know you've been hearing about um, climate science and atmospheric science in the high carbon world that, that we've created here, but I don't think you know yet or have been told yet at this conference about how that's affecting the ocean. And that, to me, is the best story of all. To me, I, I mean, I've written a lot about climate science, I've written a lot about climate change and, you know, deforestation and all that kind of stuff, but to me, the absolute best story going right now is what's happening to the global ocean and how our species is changing the basic chemistry of the most important um, part of life on the planet. So, I, but I started from absolutely not knowing anything. In fact, I'd written a book. I'd writ, I know I'd spent a, quite a long time as, as a reporter on this stuff at the, at the Globe and Mail, and I never understood that the ocean was actually important. In fact, I was in Galapagos uh, writing the last piece of my, my, of my first book, which was all about you know, planetary change, but climate and forests and stuff, and nothing about the ocean. And I was on a, on a ship with a bunch of, of um, scientists trying to um, 
you know, desperately trying to get to land, because I figured that land was where, where the real stories were. And I was, I was caught with all these people who were interested in the ocean. And I was really, really impatient with this. You know, I was thinking, geez, you know, when are we going to get over to the, you know, Darwin's laboratory? It's over there. It's not here in the water. You know, this is the... And I happened to be bunking with uh, Sylvia Earle. Does anybody here know Sylvia Earle? Yeah, she's one of the great marine biologists who figured out that, you, you know, in order to look at in order to figure out marine life, you actually have to go into the water to look at it, instead of you know, getting, taking it out of the water and laying it on a slab in a, in a lab someplace. So she was the one who figured out how to, how to do that and uh, built vessels so that she could go into the ocean, spent a lot of time down there. It was very controversial because she went there when she was really pregnant and everybody said, oh, you're going to kill your baby, you're going to kill your baby. <laughs> she never, she, she said, oh, I'm just going to be fine and she, in fact, she was fine. But she's this incredibly intimidating person. She stands about you know, this high, 90 foot, 95 pounds, soaking wet, and she's always soaking wet, you know, because she's in water so much. And I was sharing a bunk with her, and I, I didn't speak with her for about two days, I was just too scared, you know, and I, in, in, in this bunk of ours, because she was doing all these experiments on the water in Galapagos, and really excited about red tides and stuff like this, and, and I was, uh, you know, I would tiptoe over to, you know, some of the all these electronic pieces of equipment that were plugged into every outlet in this little boat we were on, and look at these and sort of look at these experiments she was running. And finally, I, you know, I got the courage to go over and lift the lid up on this very fantastically complex experiment and realized that it was her hair curler. <laughs> and I thought, okay, <laughs> this is a woman I can talk to. So I sidled up to her one day and said, okay, I understand that you're a biologist, but why are you, why are you looking at, you know, things in the ocean? What's that about? If you're a biologist, why aren't you looking at pronghorn antelopes like my old dad? And she swiveled to me like this, the full, you know, four foot eight. I'm, I'm exaggerating, she's on at least five feet tall. And she, and she said to me, well, my dear, because the ocean is where the life is. And I had never considered that in my whole, you know, all my investigations with scientists and all of the work I had done. It never had occurred to me that really the switch of life on our planet is in the ocean. And that's what she explained to me. And so I, I finished off that first book and I started looking at the ocean. And I don't know how you are when you research, but I, you know, I, you have stacks of books by your bedside. I mean, I have stacks of journal articles by my bedside that I, that I read. And all of these things were about the ocean. And I was trying to figure out how it worked biologically. I didn't yet understand that it was sick, that it is sick. And that's what I ended up concluding after all the, the, the time I spent with scientists. I, I, was, I was sure that it was fine. You know, but I just wanted to understand it. It was just simple intellectual curiosity that you know, prompted me to write this book and, or to do the research for it. And so, I, of course, what I do is get in touch with scientists and see if I can you know, tag along with them on field research like I used to do with my dad. So I, um, I phoned up, or actually I emailed uh, uh, Nancy Knowlton, who's one of the great, uh, great marine biologists. She's a coral biologist. She's the SANT professor of marine biology at the Smithsonian Institution in, D in Washington, D.C. right now. And she's a fantastic writer and she's really kind, as so many scientists are. So I emailed her one day and said, you know, I don't have a book contract or anything, but I'm really interested in understanding the ocean. Can you help me? And she said, sure, come on a, you know, why don't you come down to Panama? There's a coral spawning happening and we'll, we'll watch it together. We'll see, you know, what it's like. So I said, okay, and I just got on a plane and went down to Panama. She met me at the airport, and I said, but how do we know when they're going to spawn? And she said, well, it's one of the great mysteries of life. How do, you, how do, how do corals know when to spawn? And, and, and she said, we, we haven't figured that out yet. And I said, well, when do you think they're going to spawn? And she said, well, we think that here in this part of the Caribbean, they're going to spawn between five and seven days after the last full moon of summer, 100 minutes after sunset. And I said, they don't even have brains. How do they know this stuff? And she said, we just don't know how they know, but that's when we think they're going to do it. But we were there really early to, you know, so we could go in the water and check. But the year we were there, the water was incredibly warm. It was one of the really, you know, from climate change, the water had become incredibly warm, which meant that corals right through the Caribbean were bleached, meaning that they had expelled the little zooxanthellae that live inside them and give them nourishment and give them color. It was too warm, so the coral animals had spat these things out. So it was bleaching all through the, all through the, the, um, the Caribbean that summer, and you could see this, the flesh of these coral animals shredded off the reefs that they had created. It was, it was, it was kind of devastating. We weren't sure that the corals were going to be... Um, I'm just going to get a drink of tea. Excuse me. Flying. <laughs> 
We weren't sure that the corals were going to be healthy enough to spawn because it takes them all year to collect the energy, to get the little, the little bundles of eggs and sperm that they have to send out at this precise moment once a year. It takes them all year to get that energy together to do this stuff. So, and they were really sick, so we were, we were anxiously waiting to see whether these things were going to do what we thought they were going to do. And so we would get in the water night after night, and you can imagine just this team of PhDs with their little their little flashlights peering at the corals to see whether they were getting ready to spawn, whether the eggs and the sperm were you know, getting into bundles, night after night after night, nothing, nothing, nothing. Six days after the last full moon of summer, at 100 minutes after sunset, poof, there they went. It was amazing. And we got into the water that night, and just you know, as, as the corals were getting ready to spawn, and the whole Caribbean, the whole water of the Caribbean was filled with the sexual energy of these corals waiting to spawn. I mean, it was like electric shocks going through your body. It was absolutely unbelievable. And the whole reef, which had been sort of dormant for all those nights we were in there, just came alive with all of this. It was an orgy. It was amazing. These things, everything that wasn't reproducing was eating the, the spawn spawn of everything else that was reproducing and we saw these little brittle stars dancing on the coral reefs like this, spitting out these little ruby balls of, you know, eggs and things like this. The entire reef was alive. It was vibrant. This was the dance of life, right? And we were so excited and we saw these corals spawning and they happened right on cue and we were counting how many individuals had actually spawned because that was part of the, it, this was a count. You know, all science begins with measurement, right? So we were trying to count how many had spawned, and then we caught a whole bunch of the spawn, the embryos, in plankton nets, and took them back to the, to the lab to, um, to count how many had gotten to the 16-cell stage, which would make them viable in the wild, had we left them in the wild. So this is going to be our, our, you know, summary of how these things were doing. And we were so excited about this, because they actually had done this, this ritual, this once-a-year ritual, and we thought, oh, wow. We were calling ourselves Team Spawn. We were feeling we were on top of the world. We got back to the lab. Four o'clock in the morning, we realized, because we were doing the numbers, that only half of the coral animals that should have spawned did. And only half of the embryos that we had caught in plankton nets had gotten to the 16 cell stage. Meaning that 25% of the animals that should have spawned that year did in that part of the Caribbean. And these are the big reef building um, creatures that are less susceptible to the warmth than other, other, um, other types of corals. So it took the gloss off. You know, here we were thinking that we were witnessing this magnificent ritual of birth. And in fact, it felt like we were witnessing death. Because when you look at the numbers of the Caribbean, the, the corals in the Caribbean, 90% of the coral cover has vanished over the last 30 years alone. There's been a complete system switch there. And I didn't understand any of this. This was my first journey for seasick, the first of 13 over two and a half years as I did the research. And I couldn't understand what was happening. And so I said to them, what, what is going on here? And they said, well, this is a result of the high carbon world that we've created. And again, another penny dropped, and I thought, I don't understand how this affects the ocean. I guess I better do a lot more research. And so I started looking at, you know, more of the measurements of what's going on in the ocean. And the ocean is so complex, and, sci and the science on it is so relatively new compared to other science, you know, it's, it's more remote, that scientists haven't been putting together the pieces of what's going on in the ocean, not in a, in a, you know, in a, in a way that people like me can understand. You, you have little pieces of it, little silos of information, but you don't have a whole big complex picture of what's going on, not a synoptic view, if you will. And so I started looking at that and thinking to myself, if I were, how do I write about this? Because I'm a journalist. I mean, I have a degree in Latin literature, you know. <laughs> this is not, my, I've never taken a university science course. And I was trying to figure out how I could understand what's happening to the ocean. And I finally decided that what I would do is think of it as if it were the whole global ocean, so the entire thing. I would think of it as if it were a patient going to the doctor. So if I sent you know, it to the doctor, what, what vital signs of the ocean's you know, vibrancy would a doctor look at and how would, they, how would the trend lines be working? So I, I started looking at, at a whole bunch of different things. What, ended up, what I ended up focusing on are what scientists now think about and talk about as the evil troika. And each one of these is related to this high carbon world that we've created. So if you look at the statistics, because again, all science begins with measurement. If you look at the statistics, you probably know 
probably you can all tell me, what percentage of the, of the surface of the globe is covered by water, by ocean? Does anybody know? Sorry? About 73. Okay, but how much of the planet's habitat, the living space on the planet, is in the global ocean? Because you only live in, you either live in water or you live in air, right? So how much do you think is in the global ocean? Just a guess. Oh, throw out a few. Surprise me. Throw me out, throw me out a few. Good, good guess. Incorrect. Higher. Higher. Bang on. 99%. So 99% of the living space on the planet is in the global ocean. What percent of the oxygen you're breathing right now is, is produced by plankton? Just a guess. Ocean plankton. Actually, it's about 50, but close enough. So every second breath that you're breathing right now is oxygen produced by plankton in the ocean. Are, do you know of any other cycles that are controlled by the ocean? Can you think of any other chemical cycles that are controlled by the ocean? Water cycles connected as part of the hydrological cycle. Any others? Carbon cycle. It's controlled by the ocean. The, the nitrogen cycle is partly controlled by the ocean. So I'm, I'm putting all these pieces together, and I went, I went to one of the scientists who I, I speak with a lot, Boris Worm, who's at Dalhousie. He's a marine biologist. And I said to him, so what happens if everything on land dies? What happens to life in the ocean? And he says, bonanza, everything in the ocean is better. And then I say to him, so what happens if everything in the ocean dies? What happens to life on earth, on, on, on land? And guess what he says? Guess what he says? Yeah, then we die. So we are fully dependent on all the cycles that the, that the ocean life provides. In fact, for most of the time there's been life on the planet, almost all of it, there's been life only in the ocean. We're latecomers. We air breathers are latecomers. But because we, we see the world from the viewpoint of creatures that live in air, we look at it, we look at it, we see only the 1%. We don't see the 99%. And, and so I thought to myself, so what's happening to the chemistry of the ocean? And this is where the whole carbon issue, this high carbon world that we've created comes in. So, Everybody knows about climate change, right? Like, does everybody... Do you need a primer? You've had it this morning already, I know. Do you want another little primer on climate change? Yes? No? Yes? Yes? Well, so when we, so when we started burning fossils, we call them fuels, but in fact they're fossils. From, you know, 250 years ago, we started burning fossils. We call them coal and oil and gasoline and stuff like that, petroleum products. But really, these are animals and plants that lived millions of years ago. And, and when they died, the carbon from their bodies from those eras millions of years ago was stored in the body of the earth. We dig them up now, all over Alberta. You can see this all over the world. We dig them up and burn them. And it's not the burning that's the issue. It's the fact that that ancient carbon from millions of years ago goes up into the atmosphere in the form of carbon-based gases, usually carbon dioxide. So the ancient carbon has been added to today's carbon to increase the proportion of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The thing is that there's such a tiny proportion already of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's very, very tiny, 0.03% it was 250 years ago before we started burning. It's, very, it's easy to change that. Try to change oxygen, oxygen's 22%. It's whacking, it's really hard to change, but carbon dioxide's really little. So it's easier to change. So we've, we've changed it. Does anybody know what the CO2 proportion was before we started burning fossil fuels? What was it? It's expressed in parts per million by volume because it's so tiny. What's the number? 280. And what is it now as we stand here? Very close to 400. It's 393. You're good. You've got all the answers over there. Wow. <laughs> So we're at 393. We know it hasn't been above 300 for 20 million years, right? And we're at 393. I just got back from Durban uh, in December at the Kyoto Talks where there is no agreement on keeping it at 450. There's no agreement internationally to keep it at 450. In fact, when I was there, there were lots of politicians who were saying, you know, I used to be a 450 man and now... I'm a 560 man. I think we can go up to 560. 560 will happen if nothing else changes by about the middle of this century, 2060. And that would be a doubling from the historic 280, which is significant. 
that would be setting the stage for another mass extinction. But that's where some policymakers are thinking that it's okay to go. That's four degrees Celsius, if you want to look at it that way. So when we put all that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we know that it hangs there inert against the body of the planet. And it, ca it, holds, in, uh, it holds in warmth, right? And for years, scientists were saying, isn't it wonderful that there's the ocean absorbing some of that heat and absorbing some of that carbon dioxide? That's our buffer, it's our safety valve. And they, they thought that was a really good thing. And quite recently, relatively recently, they've started to realize that this is a problem. So about 80% of that extra heat that's been held against the body of the planet by all the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been absorbed into the global ocean. And about 33% or so of all of that extra carbon that's accumulated there from over the last 250 years as we've gone into this industrial age of burning fossils, 30% of that extra CO2 has been absorbed into the global ocean. Until about 1999, when the first paper came out on this, scientists were saying, great, CO2 in the ocean, good, excellent, less in the atmosphere, less climate change. In 1999, the first paper came out on the effects of some of that CO2 in the atmosphere on the pH of the ocean. And scientists realized that what it was actually doing is acidifying, what it is actually doing is acidifying the global ocean. So the whole global ocean, down to about 3,000 feet, has become more acidic because the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide. And when it absorbs carbon dioxide, instead of being inert, as it is in the atmosphere, in the ocean, carbon dioxide is chemically reactive. So it reacts with ocean water to make, does anybody know what it makes? Carbonic acid, it makes carbonic acid. And that brings the pH of the ocean down. So before we started burning fossils, the pH of the open ocean was about 8.2 on the pH scale, which is still on the basic side. Today it's about 8.05. But this is an exponential scale. That sounds tiny, but this is an exponential scale, like hurricanes and things like that. And actually, that amount of acidity is 30% is, is greater now than it was when we started. It's a huge, huge, huge change. It hasn't been this acidic in the ocean, ocean water has not been this acidic in 55 million years. So the atmospheric CO2 hasn't been this high in many tens of millions of years. The ocean pH has not been this low for tens of millions of years. We are at a very unusual time in the planet's history. This is not life as normal on the planet. These are globally rare occurrences. Right? And as we put more CO2 into the atmosphere, more will go into the ocean and it will become more and more acidic. I remember going to Puerto Rico as part of the research for this book and talking with one of the scientists who was an author on that very first paper. I talked to a couple of them, actually. And she said to me that she was actually at a biological meeting uh, you know, with, with a whole bunch of biologists, and they, were, they hadn't really thought about this carbon issue too much, and they started doing some, some, you know, some scribbling on the back of an envelope and realized that you know, the ocean was becoming more acidic and, 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 and she said when she did the numbers that led to the paper, she actually ran out of the room to the bathroom and threw up. And I said, why was it that important? What matters about this? And she said, well, it affects calcifiers. And I said, how does it affect calcifiers? And she says, everything in the ocean that needs to make a coral reef, anything made of calcium and carbon, limestone, anything that makes teeth or bones or shells, or you know, coral reefs, anything like that is going to be affected very badly by this because as the ocean becomes more acidic, there's less and less calcium biologically ab available to these creatures to make their shells and teeth and, and, and uh, bones. So everything in the ocean that uses calcium carbonate, that makes calcium carbonate structures, is at risk for this. And we can already see this in some of the colder parts of the ocean. So the colder parts of the ocean are in the Southern Ocean and the Arctic, and they absorb more carbon dioxide, so they're already more acidic. And you can already see pitting in the shells of some sea snails in the, in the Southern Ocean. In the Arctic, you can also see some effects. Over time, as scientists sort of, are, they've been scrambling to try to figure out what the effects on the, on the global system will be from this greater acidity. It's still on the basic side, by the way. That, you know, it's, it's going toward the acidic side. Um, so, but that, and that process is called ocean acidification. But scientists have figured out, even just in the last few years, that they've, they've witnessed things like, you know, crabs just what they, they, they call bleeding 
They have bleeding shells now. They just start shedding calcium off their shells. Um, some, some shrimps just, you know, you can snap bits of them off because the shells are so thin. The oyster fishery on the, on the west coast of, uh, of North America has been absolutely devastated because the embryos of, of oysters can't survive in the acidity that's already there. And we're seeing these effects right through the, the global ocean. Scientists have recently, in the last couple of years, started to look at what happens to the physiology of creatures that live in this. Like, can they maintain their own internal chemistry? And some can. Some creatures can. But as the ocean becomes more acidic, the likelihood of the whole of the assemblage of life in the ocean being able to maintain it, their internal chemi chemistry is becoming more and more remote. So they're, they're seeing fish that become stupid instead of swimming away from predators, they swim toward them. Not a great strategy for survival. <laughs> so they're seeing all sorts of effects that they didn't expect to see, and they, they're, they're convinced that some creatures, at least in the ocean, will be fine. They're not sure what's going to happen to plankton, for example. Many of the plankton that produce all this oxygen that we're breathing right now have calcium carbonate shells. What happens to a naked plankton? Does it still do the same thing that it should do in the ocean? Does it still provide the same metabolic effect on the ocean that it has been providing. What happens? And those are great unknowns in the ocean. So this whole, the, the effect of the, the high carbon world on ocean acidification is a huge, huge, huge issue. This is the one that scientists stay awake at night on. This is the one that they, they are probably most worried about if you look at them. But then there are, there are two other ways, though, that the high carbon world is affecting the ocean very greatly. What do you, so pH is one of them. What, what do you think another one is? What would you say? What's a guess? Sorry? Um, actually, there is an effect on ocean currents. That's, that's a, that, I'll get to that in a minute. That's, that's a good one. Any other effects? What do you think? If you were to just think about this, what would you imagine might be effects? Um, it changes patterns of salinity. Absolute salinity is the same changes patterns of salinity because you've got all the, war all the warming in the Arctic, so all that fresh ice, that freshwater ice is melting, so it's fresher at the poles. What else do you think would, would happen? Yes! Wow, who said that? Well done, you. Very good. Anything else? Dissolved oxygen? Temperature. Exactly. Who said temperature? Yeah. So all that extra heat that's been absorbed into the, into the ocean um, has, it's, you know, it's, it's a very tiny rise, but it's big in global terms. So it's only 0.33 of a degree Celsius since about 1875 that the, that the temperature has risen in the surface part of the ocean. But that, that means a lot, in, and in certain parts of the oceans, it's much, much bigger than that. So if you think about temperature, I mean, the, the best example I found when I, was, when I was doing my research for this was in Plymouth. Has anybody here been to Plymouth? England? Nobody's been to Plymouth? You've been to Plymouth. Have you been to the aquarium up, look, overlooking the, the Plymouth Sound? Yeah, so in, a, in about uh, 1998, they opened this great big, huge new aquarium in Plymouth overlooking the Plymouth Sound. And the centerpiece to this aquarium is the Mediterranean tank. So there's this, you, you know, you go and you stand underneath and you see all these creatures that live in the Mediterranean. Except today, in Plymouth, they can't call it the Mediterranean tank anymore. Why? What's a guess? What's that? Y yes, in a way. The Mediterranean's too hot for the creatures that used to live there. So guess where they live now? In the Plymouth Sound. Yeah, so they have all these creatures that, like, they have barracudas breeding in the Plymouth Sound, for example. So in the space of just 14 years, from when they opened this thing, they can no longer call this the, the Mediterranean tank. And that phenomenon is repeated right throughout the global ocean. So creatures are moving toward the colder waters, away from the, the equator where it's hotter, and toward cooler parts of the global ocean. And, the, and, and they're moving in, they're migrating in ways that are unexpected, and they're migrating in ways that don't reproduce the assemblage of life that was there where they came from. So, and they're replacing other creatures which are trying to go further north to even colder waters. And so this whole intricate dance of life that has evolved to work in the ocean is shifting in ways that, that scientists are still racing to catch up with. So temperature is a big, big deal. And the third issue, if you, if you think about this, so that's, that's acidity, 
um, temperature and we had the other ants from over here, that, and it's dissolved oxygen. So as the water becomes warmer, it absorbs less dissolved oxygen. But, there, but there's also this phenomenon known as dead zones. Have you guys been hearing about dead zones? You know about dead zones? Well, I went, I'd spe spent a bunch of time in a, in a scientific cruise um, looking at one of the biggest dead zones in the world, which is in the Gulf of Mexico. So this thing is, the year I was there, it was 22,000 square kilometers just in area. This thing is absolutely immense. That doesn't count the volume of this thing. And it's been, it, it comes every spring and it goes away every winter. And every year it gets bigger and bigger, except for this year when it got a lot smaller because of the drought. And I'll explain in a second why that happened. But so I was on this scientific cruise for something like 12 days. And scientific cruises, has anybody here been on one? Scientific, yeah, you know then. The, it, it, they're brutal. Like you're, 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 you've got no privacy. You're up all hours doing watches and doing scientific testing and all this kind of stuff. And, and everybody is in absolute sort of liver failure because there's never drinking, right? You can never drink on a scientific cruise. <laughs> and everybody's in painfully, uh, painfully clear withdrawal from this, right? So everybody's kind of wandering around like this. And as the cruise get, goes on and on, it gets worse and worse and worse, and people are shedding all sorts of pounds and all kinds of stuff. The one I was on, they actually had, they had a mutiny at one point because um, the, they had a new chef. The galley uh, workings are critical on these things. The food becomes critically important on these, on these cruises, these scientific cruises. And they had, a, they had a new chef who liked to make salads. They had an absolute mutiny on the ship. Where was the deep fryer, was the question. <laughs> they had to finally get this guy by the ear and take him into the back and say, bring out the deep fryer. And so, of course, he did. This was to salve all the, uh, the wounded livers um, of these people who were in detox. But anyway, apart from that, they're fascinating things, and it's really, it's very tough work. We had this one guy on this cruise who was trying to, trying to see in the dead zone if he, could, if he could find fish, any fish in the dead zone. The dead zone is a zone that has little or no oxygen. And they call it the blob, actually, because it's just unmixable. So he was trying to trawl through these different layers of the, of the, of the dead zone. And we knew there was no oxygen, but we thought there might be a few fish and he found nothing, trawl after trawl after trawl, and there was absolutely nothing that came up in these nets, to the point that he finally said, we must have a problem with our equipment. Let's go into part of the global ocean where there actually is, you know, part of the, the Gulf of Mexico where there actually is some, uh, some oxygen and see if our, our nets are going to work. So we did. We cruised off into part of the, you know, put down our... our instruments to see what, you know, how much oxygen was there. There was oxygen. He started trawling, came up with masses of fish. It wasn't our nets, it was the fact that in this dead zone, nothing can live, very little can live. And we were looking even at the microbial level, there was almost nothing there. And what was there was in different assemblages. So the whole structure of life in this part of the, in the ocean was, was different. So what causes a dead zone? Anybody know? You're good. You are really good. <laughs> phosphorus and nitrogen is the answer. Where does the phosphorus and nitrogen come from? Agriculture. Who said that? Who said, what was the other answer? Farms. So all up and down the Mississippi River, in this case, you have soybean farms and corn farms, and you have farmers putting on synthetic chemicals, phosphorus and nitrogen, trying to make their plants grow. This is, this is you know, and they're, of course they're petroleum-based. So they're putting on all of these chemicals, but they're putting them on incorrectly and too much of them, and so it's just going off in a, in a, in a wash down the Mississippi River, collecting in the Mississippi Water Rivershed and going off at the mouth of the Mississippi River into the, into the Gulf of Mexico, where it's still food for plants, right? It's still phosphorus and nitrogen, and, and algae go crazy for this stuff. They bloom, they, they, there's nothing there to eat them, they go crazy, it's like the feast of all feasts. They die, fall to the bottom, and then the second part of the process takes over, which is that bacteria start to eat them up, to decompose them, and they start using up the oxygen, the limited oxygen in the, in the water column at that point. So from one little tiny spot, on the bottom of the floor of the, of the ocean at the mouth of the, Missis mouth of the Mississippi spreads this incredible dead zone, 22,000 square kilometers the year I was there, and much bigger in some other years. Why was it smaller this year? Drought. The water wasn't flowing into the Mississippi, so therefore it didn't carry all, of those, all that phosphorus and nitrogen down the watershed and into the Gulf of Mexico. So probably it's still on the land, and probably next year's dead zone, should there not be a drought, will be quite big, conceptually. 
So that's what happens. So when I started doing the research for this book, Seasick, um, I remember the big news story was that, that you know, scientists had cataloged 150 dead zones in the global coastal, in coastal parts of the, of the global ocean. 150, it was huge. By the time I finished the research for, for Seasick, the official number was 407. These are, the, the number is growing over time, and three of those are the ones that relate directly to this high carbon world that we're talking about now. Three of those dead zones, and it relates to the current structure changes that you were talking about over there. Three of them are caused not by direct phosphorus and nitrogen inputs from farming or whatever, you know, from human waste or whatever. Three of them are caused by changes to the structure of the currents, and that's caused by climate change. So three of these massive dead zones, there's one off the coast of Oregon that's absolutely huge that was described scientifically for the first time in 2008, are caused by climate change that brings up new nutrients for these, to, to feed these algal blooms and then this whole process of the dead zone takes over again. And what is significant, if you're a scientist looking at this, what is significant about the fact that they're caused by climate change as opposed to fertilizers? Why does that matter to you? because we're just going to get more. And what else? We can't control them. We don't know when and where they're going to appear. So there's one off the coast of Oregon, there are two off the coast of Africa. And these are in parts of the global ocean that should be absolutely teeming with life. It sh they should just be thick with life. And in fact, they are devoid of life. They are graveyards. So how do you predict where that's going to go? So if you're a scientist looking at this stuff, and if you're a paleontologist in particular who's looking at this kind of stuff, you think to yourself, Okay, the ocean has, this is how scientists talk about it, the ocean has gone sour, breathless, and warm. That's the way they talk about it. Why does it matter if, if that happens? What is, the, what is the end point to all of that, the end game to all of that? Well, if you're a paleontologist looking at that, you look back at the mass extinctions the planets had. How many have we had? Do you know? Does anybody know that number off by heart? Yeah, who said that? Five. When the last one was, when the dinosaurs died out, 65 million years ago, when the dinosaurs died out. And we think of that as the really big one, but that wasn't the really big one. The really big one was 252 million years ago, the Permian extinction, when 95% of species on the planet, land and sea, went extinct. 95%, absolutely massive. So scientists have been really focusing on that recently, trying to figure out how that happened and, and, you know, and what was the killing mechanism within the animals themselves and the plants, what actually killed them. And they've come to realize that in that extinction spasm in particular, but it, this is common among the extinction spasms, three things happened to the global ocean. Guess what they were? Sour, warm, and breathless. <laughs> Precisely. In that particular instance, the Permian extinction, what the, the, the ocean got that way because the Siberian traps, the geological formation was being formed in what is now northern um, in northern Russia. The Siberian Traps Formation is a big geological formation made by volcanic, volcanic activity. So there was this massive spasm of volcanic activity 252 million years ago that put all sorts of carbon into the atmosphere that eventually went into the ocean that caused it to become sour, warm, and breathless. And that caused 95% of the species on the planet to go extinct because, of course, the ocean has the switch of life. When it does not support life, then the planet does not support life. That's the critical point. So today, there's been a recent study on this too, you probably already know it. Today, we are putting carbon into the atmosphere through burning of fossil fuels. How do you think it relates to the pace at which carbon went into the atmosphere 252 million years ago? Just a guess. Much faster. Today, we're putting carbon into the atmosphere 10 times as quickly as when the Siberian traps were formed and when the Permian extinction happened. There was just a recent paper on this. So we are more disastrous to life on the planet at this point than the Siberian traps formation, than volcanic activity. It's hard to believe, isn't it? It's like we look around and everything looks sort of normal. We have a drought in the US and we see that Bangladesh is you know, melting away and stuff like that, and the Arctic is melting. And, but it doesn't feel like we're at this incredibly different and difficult and anomalous time in the planet's entire history of life. 3.5 billion years, and this is a really unusual time 
It doesn't feel like it, and we're the species that's doing it. So if you're, if you're like me, you're like, this was not what I expected to find. Like, I am a Latin major, right? I'm a journalist. I'm, I didn't expect to schlep around the world and discover that we're, my species is setting the table for a mass extinction. I didn't get that. And by the way, the timing on this, you know, the 560 man, he said he could live with 560. Well, 560 relates to four degrees Celsius. 560 in the atmosphere, does anybody know what that means in terms of pH in the ocean? Does anybody know what happened to know that figure? So we started, the open ocean pH started at 8.2, today it's 8.05. If we keep putting this much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, by 2060, when it's 560 parts per million in the atmosphere, the ocean pH will be 7.8 which as far as I can understand is unknown in the geological record. So even during the Permian extinction, it never went that low. This is a huge and difficult and different number for creatures in, in the planet. So this is, so the 560 man, he's saying 560, I'm saying mass extinction, <laughs> but that's not what they're saying. But I'm looking at this and putting it all together and thinking, this is depressing, right? I mean, this is, <laughs> this is not what I expected to find. I expected to just, write this nice little book about how the ocean system worked and how it supported life and I wanted to understand the currents and, and I didn't think that I was going to find what I found. And I actually went into quite a severe depression. I was, right at, I, I, I was right at the end of my research and I thought, why should I write a book about this? This would be insane. That would be cutting down trees and trees absorb CO2. That would be <laughs> the wrong strategy. And I, I just went to bed for about a month. And I had one journey left that I had, that I had set up, you know, that I had, um, that I had set up with, with another scientist. And this, this was a really tough one because I decided that I really wanted to be in this great big huge, you know, I wanted to be in the ocean, not just snorkeling, not just diving, not just, you know, at, at 140 feet. I wanted to be really, really deep in the ocean. And so I found a scientist and persuaded her to take me on one of her scientific ex expeditions that would go down to 3,000 feet. Do we have any divers in the room? Anybody scuba diver? Yeah, how, how deep have you been? You've been to 100 feet. Anybody else? Yeah, how, how deep have you been? 120? That's really deep. I mean, for scuba diving, that's really, really deep. And very few humans have ever been that deep. So we were going to 3,000 feet. This is to the bottom of the ocean, to a part of the planet nobody had ever seen before. And so I'm lying in bed thinking, geez, can I get out of bed and take another plane and go on another ship and do this. And I thought, oh, don't be a wuss, just do it. But, I'm, but I was mired in despair. It was really one foot after the other. I was just trying to you know, get myself there. It was really, really hard. I just, I didn't see the point in it. And I got there, first night, dark, you know, ship. The, the, the scientist uh, who is gonna be, you know, on board with me on this little, who's, a, who's agreed to let me do this, turns to me and says, okay, Mitchell, you're going to be the first newbie to go in the submersible to 3,000 feet. And I was terrified. I was absolutely terrified. My eyes were like this all night. I didn't sleep. We were going to go down at 8 o'clock in the morning. My eyes are like saucers, right? I mean, I was just terrified. And I, I thought to myself, because I had deliberately not researched too much about this submersible, because I knew if I did that, yeah, it was, going to be, uh, it was going to be a pretty bad situation. So I get up on board, and they've already warned us that it's going to be really, really dark, of course, at 3,000 feet, and really, really cold. So I'm standing on deck, if you can just picture this, holding all my blankies in one hand, because I know it's going to be really cold, and I look up at this thing, and it's, it's, it's a two-part submersible. And I had some naive notion that we'd be tethered to the mothership, you know, when we went off to 3,000 feet. No, we're, we're talking battery power to get us down and up, right? No tether. I'm looking at this thing, and it's two parts. So there's, there's this great big huge sphere at the front, and it's just big enough for two people, the, the scientist and the pilot, the, the, you know, the, the captain of this vessel. And I'm looking there and saying, Where's, where am I going to be? And they say, oh, you're going to be in the back part. The back part is, is, is a little aluminum chamber. Think of two bathtubs, one on top of the other, that contains the whole electronic guts of this thing. And it's just barely big enough for me and for the engineer to get in as long as we lie down, you know, sort of head to toe that kind of thing. So there are two little portholes so I can, you know, look out the side. And I'm thinking, I'm looking at this thing and my despair over the fate of the planet has miraculously vanished, right? I am now in the grip of personal terror 
you know, am I going to make it through the day? That's the only thing I care about at this point, right? And I, I look at this thing and I'm, I'm just not sure if I can get into it. I'm not sure if I can get it, you know, walk the plank and get up into this little vessel. And so the, the chief scientist comes over to me and she's another, you know, five foot, 95 pounder, wonderful scientist. Her name is Shirley Pomponi. And she says to me, so how are you doing? And I say, you know what, I'm really scared. She says, oh, there's no need to be worried. Nobody's died in that back chamber now for quite a few years. And she goes on to explain to me how the last guys died, which, which pleasingly, metaphorically, happened to have been that there, there's a little scrubber that scrubs out the carbon dioxide you breathe out when you're in this little confined chamber. And then, you know, they feed in a little oxygen. But the scrubber to get the, to get the CO2 out of the little chamber broke. And so they died from CO2 poisoning, right? And I'm thinking, okay, I get the cosmic message in this. You know, it's, <laughs> this is like the metaphor for the planet. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. And then she says, but we fixed it. You should be fine. Just don't lean up against the fan. You know, just make sure you don't, don't block it. And so I'm thinking, okay, I just close my eyes. I walk up and get into this thing. I lie down. Up comes the engineer who's been down. He's nonchalant. He's been down 600 times in this vessel. He helped to build it. He's, he, you know, he's, he's very cool. So we get in there and he says to me, okay, you know, we have a different air system in this little back chamber from the, the people in the front, you know, not in the sphere. They have, we have different, I say, why do we have different air systems? And he says, well, because, you know, if they die, we can still get up. And if we die, they can still get up. And he says, now let me explain to you what you will need to do if we're at 3,000 feet and the other three of us die. And okay, I've got sweat on my upper lip. I am writing notes like no journalist has ever taken notes in her life trying to figure out how I can get this thing up if I'm down there stranded with battery power, no tethering and anything. And, and, and with that, we, we go. Like the hat shuts and we, we spend half an hour going down to part of the planet nobody has ever seen before. And we are going to be the very first people. And I keep wondering, I keep expecting the wonder to just flood over me. I, I've been wanting this for two and a half years. You know, I've just been dreaming about going down to this part of the, you know, this deep in the ocean. It's incredibly rare. I know I'm really, you know, like it's really a, a, a great chance. And I cannot get rid of my terror. You know, I even get down to the bottom. My, my buddy here, you know, the, the engineer is reading a paperback novel, right? He's totally nonchalant. I am just acrid with sweat, because I am so terrified by this. We get down to the bottom, we see all these life forms. We're at 3,000 feet. There's all of this fantastic life down there, all these things that nobody has ever seen before, some things that, have un that are undescribed to science. You know, these little, I'm, there's this porthole here, and this little school of fish floats by, swims by, and they're, no, they're pink and no bigger than my little fingernail. And I'm thinking, this is wonderful, why can't I feel it, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, this ha and we're two hours into a three, three and a half hour journey, and I realize the human limitation has hit a, an end point, and, and the limitation in my point, in my case, was my bladder. So I'm down there, and there is nowhere to go, right? <laughs> Literally nowhere to go. And I'm terrified by this, because I'm thinking, what am I supposed to do? I'm, in a, I'm at 3,000 feet in a submersible, so I finally turn to my my engineer who's, you know, I'm lying like this, you know, his head is here, my feet are here, and I say to him, look, we have a problem. And he says, okay, I, we can deal with this. He reaches behind him into one of these little cabinets behind him, and he brings out this huge, big Ziploc bag filled with super absorbent foam and a little guide that they have to fit in the top. I want to go on record now as saying that the guide was made for boys. <laughs> And he says to me, just keep these two pieces together and everything should be fine. And I'm in this little confined space, right, and that I can't even sit up straight in. And his head is right here. <laughs> and I've got my pants at my ankles. And the only thing I'm thinking about at this point is making sure that the, I hit the guide. That's because I've got to get these two you know, pieces together. And my entire being is focused on this. And I want to tell you right now that I hit the guide. <laughs> the guide, alas, was no longer attached to the Ziploc bag. And I peed all over the engineer and all over the inside of the submersible and all over the electronic equipment that was keeping us alive at 3,000 feet. And the, <laughs> the poor engineer 
brings out a whole bunch of blankets and we sop this stuff up and he fetches a great big, huge, even bigger Ziploc bag. And, uh, and that's where the hope came in. Because it's one of those basic messages. You know, I'm sitting there, I think to myself, you know, you foul your nest, you clean it up, right? And it's so easy to get caught in despair, mired in cynicism and despair. And in fact, hope for our species is a choice. If you don't choose hope, then there simply isn't any. And so what I did then was choose to hope. I know that there are ways of, of solving this issue, but it's more a cultural and spiritual and choice issue than it is any kind of a technological issue. And with that, I rose to the surface and wrote the book. Thank you.